shooting it raw? Yes. Shooting it raw. Uh, my name is Dr. Justin McGrail. Uh, I have a PhD in art history, and I've been a professor for the last 20 years. And in terms of an early poignant photographic memory for me it takes me back. I'd be 16 years old. And I remember being with my mother on one of the very rare occasions my mother and I went on vacation together. And we were in Nassau in the Bahamas. And I had a 35 millimeter Minolta XG1, fully manual. I love that camera. I was part of the photography club at school, learning how to work a dark room. And while I was in Nassau, everything was super cheap. And my mother incredibly bought me uh, an 80 to 200 zoom. It was, I couldn't believe it was like a birthday present. And I went out shooting, having a great time. And a photograph I took, I can picture it in my head, was of a statue. Because what the lens let me do was isolate a certain aspect, the face. And so it was the face. It looked really good. I won $50 with that photograph at my school. What I realize now is that it was a photograph of a figure who I would teach a lot, Christopher Columbus. As we live in a post-colonial indigenized curriculum. Hmm. So I find it very important that a significant early, early step, 1984, yeah, right there, it all kind of came together, art and political perspective. Justin McGrail, thank you for joining me. We tried to have you on uh, a couple of days ago or whatever, and uh, the tech god said, no, you will not. Yeah. But finally, we, re we reconnected, and... Just a few, I mean, seeing your face, we caught, we caught up very, very little, but I, I wanted, I stopped us because I wanted yes. us to, to, we haven't seen each other in a very long time. Uh, we yes. used to perform together in Fluffy Pagan Echoes. Uh, Indeed. And as Vince said in a previous podcast for Shooting It Raw, and you've always been a really good raconteur or a storyteller mm -hmm. or, you know, so, so this is going to yeah. come through. Okay. I am I am so happy to see your face. I'm so happy to, to have you on, on the podcast. Um, well, thank you, Ran. And it's a real pleasure. It really was uh, a surprise out of the blue to be invited. Uh, and then to uh, listen to Vin Vince, Victoria, and Scott's interview. And so to realize that I am the final echo, <laughs> which I just thought was so poetic, you know. Um, and also because... I've been thinking a lot about this. Uh, my father is 89 years old and he's in failing health and he's okay though. But one thing, someone asked me to write something about him and the one gift my father had, a month, he was a very, he's a very amazing guy, storytelling. Oh, okay, nice. And so my whole life, you know, every, and we ate dinner together as a family Every meal for 18 years, I nice. lived with my parents. Wow. And every night, dad would tell stories. Wow. You know, um, I have a daughter. Uh, she's, uh, she's the first podcast episode is actually with her. We actually listened to it just today. Congratulations, We're, by the way. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it, it didn't take much more than inserting penis into uh, yeah, Dalian's well. vagina and letting <laughs> it go from there. Yes, well. But yeah, so one of the things that, you know, that's quite interesting is that it's amazing how um, certain habits get passed along that can be conscious or unconscious. So you're talking about Ooh. your father, storytelling. And similarly, you know, for better or for worse, Cadence's um, personal habit is, you know, what, well, she's quite articulate and talks a lot. But, but she sings a lot and, and she's very expressive. So, so I, I, I hear you. I love her name. Well, yeah, you, you know, you know where, where that landed from. Let's dive into the photos, and we'll get to know you through them. And the first one is uh, uh, in, entitled "Raw One," uh, and it's let me. I, I'm going to describe it. It's you in a sort of white button-up shirt with a black, a very thin black tie, uh, a black jacket, a blazer. <laughs> I think there's a pin of venom, or so I can't see what it is because there's a reflection. But it, it, I don't know what the pin, what's on the pin. You're in an office, probably. 
there are two posters behind you. One is like a bunch of monkeys on a pink, whatever. That's you, Banksy. That's Banksy. Okay. What's great is um, the image is like a perfect standard portrait. You're looking right into the into the into the camera. Uh, you've got your your hair is all quaff, uh, salt and pepper hair. Uh, you have the highlights. You have the highlights in your eyes. Really warm, open expression. And what I really kind of what kind of for me makes a picture one is your face and the sort of oh. the kindness and also the fact that just behind your shoulder your right shoulder are like it's like you put if this is your office you put like sunglasses like one two three like sunglasses ha- hang on a hook and okay so why why start with this photo well to be honest um I didn't. I just included that as the author portrait. Ah. So uh, the other, but I will say about that is, and this just speaks to who I am. That actually is my kitchen. Oh, n- what? That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. The sunglasses are right above the dining room table. I like to think that this apartment where I live, where I've been for ten years, uh, this is maximum Justin. Okay. Nice. Yeah, so I and I when I say floor to ceiling pictures, mm. yeah. So so that's what that is about. And one thing that's nice is the reason why I'm smiling so nicely and also dressed well. Um, that evening, I had just I'm just come back from a video recording of what's called Poetrio, okay. which is a friend of mine who is a saxophone player and writing poetry. So it's myself with a jazz trio. Oh, nice. Yeah, so I just I just literally, I, I'm so happy to say I literally just finished cutting an album oh. just before that photograph. Pimp the album. What's the album called? Well, we don't know yet because it's in post-production, but it'll be um, Poetrio. Oh. Poetry, but you just combine trio on the end. Oh, I, I, okay, so Victoria has continued with, with the performance art. Scott yes. hasn't really continued I haven't continued with performance poetry or anything like that. Uh, all, you know, although I'd say some of my previous uh, projects have been more performances than anything. And But I love the fact that you're still doing spoken word yeah. poetry. It's wicked. Yeah. I'm just about to, um, I've celebrated 30 years of performance. Oh, my goodness. Uh, uh, this year was, marks 30 years. And... One of the links that I sent to you was uh, Meridian Dot Is, mm-hmm. and Meridian is a collaboration that I've been part of for, for almost nine years. God, it's all about time. It'll be nine years in January, which is a combination of digital video, electronic ambient soundscape, mm. uh, live female vocals, banjo, and spoken word poetry. Oh, wicked. These are performance events that are about 45 to 60 minutes long. They can have as many as 10 poems as oh, part wow. of them. I, I love how you, you kind of like, you kind of set up the, the musical air, it's the musical landscape and the, mm-hmm. the kind of the, the ambient sound. And, and you, you have to carve out in the description the fact that there's a banjo. Because the banjo is always like, yeah. it's like a signature instrument. It is. <laughs> Absolutely. And it's kind of like, uh, and it's wonderful because our banjo player also plays electric guitar and acoustic guitar. So when people would come, her side of the stage, the first thing they see is a banjo. Nice. So there's this, you know, again, traditional. Anyway, so I recommend everyone go to Meridian.is. Oh, okay, that's, so that's wicked. That's very much what I've been part of. Oh, that's amazing. I'm still doing solo. I've done all sorts of stuff. And you're, okay, so yeah. one of the things that I find delightful is that you're, you're based in Victoria. For the people, you know, I've kind of mentioned before that I spent a small stint in, in Victoria and really loved that city. Oh. I mean, I know, I know it's small and it's not exactly cosmopolitan in the sort of big city sense, but as far as my character and what I love to do, I very much like Victoria. I love Victoria. I think it's a great city. It's, I've been here 19 years I moved to Victoria to start my PhD at the University of Victoria. And I agree with everything you said that Victoria is definitely lacking for certain. I mean, there's not even a million people on Vancouver Island. Mm. Having said that, as I've grown older and as I've slowed down, shall we say, uh, I really, the environment here is 
like nothing else. Yeah, it's really. And I'm very amazing. happy that hey, my wife who lives in Beijing, which is where I'm heading next. Uh, she loves it here. She was here for you know over half a year, and so this is kind of the island is the place to be. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's uh, let's go on to the next Why don't we photo. Have a look at- so yeah, look at the next photo. I know you and okay. I are going to talk personally because we're we're friends and we haven't seen you see each other in so long. Yes. But but I, I think all the 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 stuff in the margins will kind of bleed into the conversation. Yes. So this one uh, is the one that there is it's it's delightfully confusing and and perfect. So it's like a um, <laughs> what do you want to describe? Actually, wonder? yeah, the wonder one. So why don't you you want to describe it? You'll do it as good I a will. job. All right. So. Um, the photograph, which is wonder, uh, what you're looking at is in a portrait format, it's a white field, which has got a lovely play of shadows uh, running down the left side and along the bottom, and then a nice dappled shadow effect. That's through glass onto this white sheet. And in the middle, in red block text, all caps, it says wonder. Now, this is a photograph. It's a recent photograph, but it is a text-based piece of art that I made in 2002 in Victoria. So the first theme I want to talk to you about, Ron, is everyday life, because Mm -hmm. I think that applies to photography, art, and the poetry that you and I have in common. So wonder is a collage. Mm -hmm. It was rediscovered, and it was something I made when I was teaching, the first time I was ever teaching postmodern art. Oh, okay. Art from the 60s. Mm-hmm. And there's an artist who I really like named Ed Rushka. Okay. And Ed Rushka did uh, one phase was called word paintings. So you'd have these beautiful abstract color fields and then over wit superimposed really, really straight lettering and then often fr- things that don't even make sense. Right. And the students were having a hard time, partly because it was kind of dated. Mm-hmm. It was a little 60-ish. Uh, but also because the students, you know, you you know, university students are both incredibly daring and unbelievably conservative, it seems, mm. when you're teaching. So to get them started, I thought of Wonder. So I went to my local grocery store, and I didn't want to buy a loaf of Wonder Bread. <laughs> because I didn't, I, there's no way I could eat that. So instead, I found that Wonder made English muffins. Okay. And at the I was married at the time, and my wife loved English muffins, so I thought she'll be fine with that. So I bought them, took them home, gave her the muffins. I took the packaging and then cut out, Mm -hmm. and then with very little amount of glue, sort of stuck it on a piece of paper and then shot it on slide film. Nice. And made it a slide. And so you have to imagine you're in a lecture theater with 80 students, Mm -hmm. and then it's like, okay, well, what about this? Click, and that comes up. And... The deafening silence <laughs> is suddenly broken by everyone has an opinion on wonder. Oh, interesting. Right? Yeah. Um, and I realized that both through teaching and through my own research, um, everyday life and an interest in daily visual content is really kind of drives a lot of what I've been doing. It explains my apartment. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's a theorist who died only a couple years ago, more of a philosopher. You might be familiar with him, Arthur C. Danto. Mm. Arthur C. Danto. No, no, sorry. He wrote a book called Transfiguration of the Commonplace. Okay. And that's about taking ordinary things, and if you look at them at the right angle, they're mm. extraordinary. Yeah, of course. Got it. And so that kind of fascination with common experience both in art that I was teaching, but also in the art I was making. Right. And the name that I have for the poetry collection, I just made a a recent collection, Everyday Poetry Mm -hmm. in Modern Times. Mm. It's a play on a title, but the notion of everyday poetry really does actually work because I have, unlike when I was younger, I like to think I'm less pretentious now (laughs) than I was. So the vocabulary Mm. is increasingly common words, Uh uh regular words, just regular common language, common experiences as the basis of connection for performance. Okay. And this carries over in poetry performance, 
uh, in the books I make, but also in the photography, mm -hmm. because I've been an avid photographer most of my life. And also, you this I bet you find weird, painting. Okay. Because I've been painting. Okay. And I'm almost finished. And currently, I'm looking in my on my walls where I have a lot of paintings, and I've been doing word painting for the last two years. Okay. Okay. Cool. And um, it's very satisfying. I got to yeah. tell you. Hey, I quite like Ditto. Mm -hmm. I think that was <laughs> there you go. That Ditto is a, is almost an onomatopoeia. You know, it's like Ditto. Exactly. You know, it's, you know, it's like it's like one of those. I don't know what the etymology of Ditto is, but it's one of those funny. Ditto is like a nice <laughs> shorthand, like. Doing. Hey, another thing that you said that I think is quite sort of inspired in my head was. Okay, so my first degree was in creative writing, and I focused specifically on poetry. And in a way, what is more frivolous, idiotic, worthless, pointless, other than to the people who love poetry? It is so not useful. Story is like you give a whole narrative, but some poetics is just up in the air and is quite abstract and is quite hard to anchor to any particular idea. And, and in a way, I was thinking, I was quite moved. I was, I was thinking about BP Nickel and, and just thinking like, is this going to be a thing that I will return to? But I, I see that, that you're still very much swimming in that soup. You're still very much in it. And I, I'm, I'm amazed. Yeah. I'm impressed. Yeah. Respect. Well, yes. And, and guess what, Ren, as I discovered in the poetry slam community, which I, without trying, became part of in the, in the nineties when yeah. I left Montreal, sometimes just by getting old, uh -huh. just by surviving, you just start, you know, like it really is. Cause as you and I know, like in the Canadian art world, it's very difficult to support yourself and to keep going. Sure. And it, it becomes a very moving experience to reconnect with people and to find out who is still Firing it at go who's still going. Wonder. Uh, so let me also, you know, it it is that kind of um, image that is for somebody who who does not know much about art or does not really spend much time in that. They might look at it and let be left cold or left warm. You know, it's it's one of these things though that, like for example, Hong Kong is very literal. Right, every it's very yeah. utilitarian, very literal, on the whole. And sometimes I feel that people have very little patience for that, not having a clear understanding of what's the point. And I could see how, in a way, this image in a classroom classroom of of, of students might look mm -hmm. at it and it be a good starting point for a conversation and in a way as an art piece it only works because of the conversation that would be created by something so simple really yeah and that there's by the way it's also different that in the slide and in the photograph that i sent you mm -hmm. wonder is more or less centered right okay the work as it exists in three dimensions in the frame Wonder is right at the bottom, slightly to the right. Okay. Which makes the blankness mm -hmm. of the center of the page the, the yeah. focus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got it, got it. That's wonder. Okay. Yeah. Let's let's move on to the next photo. And I love talking shop with oh. you, Justin. Man, I've missed your voice. I've missed your voice. I've missed your face. Oh, <laughs> uh, dude. Uh, you know, because for, yeah, for a while, we were such a family. It was. So... This one, number two, is, uh, uh, well, I called it Raw 3, and it's essentially you crouched on your, on the, on your heels, yep. holding up a, I guess it's a camera phone? My, uh, uh, iPhone. Uh, sorry, a, a iPhone, yeah. Okay, so it looks like, I guess you're photographing an external sculpture of some sort. How about you describe it? Um, because yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting thing on, to, for what eyes, what, what greets the eye. Yeah, well, and again, I, I chose um, I chose it as something that would be interesting. That work, it was from 2018, and I took that in London, England, 
which is an unbelievably expensive town, I got to tell you. Unlike um, London, Ontario. Yes, got it. Unlike, yeah, unlike London, Ontario, which is, you'll go, you'll go, don't worry, you'll have cash when you get home. Because yeah? I, I love how you said London, England. <laughs> <laughs> It's just like, yeah, yeah, as opposed to, (laughs) okay. Well, you know. You know, actually, London, Ontario has an amazingly uh, strong uh, conceptual art scene. Yes, it does, Fanshawe College. But anyway. Okay, okay. sorry. (laughs) So that photograph, I am, in fact, uh, I'm crouched down in front of a sculpture, uh, Rana Begum's sculpture, number 84, and it's from Freeze. Uh, Freeze is an annual art fair in London, and it's a big, it's one of the bigger ones. And so there's, there's art all over the place. Oh, wow. And so this was in Regent's Park. Mm. So what I thought was so fun about that, and why I, I mean, I've got it on my wall, I printed it, I enlarged it, is that it's, on one hand, a self-portrait. I'm in the center, leaning down, and I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the sculpture. Now, the sculpture, Begum's sculpture, is very simple. It's simply rectangular panes of colored glass, which are all about, I think, about seven feet tall, mm. maybe, maybe six. But they're of different colors, mostly prime. They're all primary color. Right. Red, yellow, blue, right? That's awesome. But the, but the order that you see them if you see if you see if you see just red that's because it's just red Mm -hmm. but i think right next to red is purple Mm -hmm. so that means there's blue and red so it's a it's a complex color Mm -hmm. element but when i so when i'm sitting there the figures on the left and the right the the couple walking Mm -hmm. and then the uh the two people sitting they are uh on the same side Right, so that's on the other side of the sculpture. Okay, okay, but okay. Where I am, I'm on the other side, and I'm reflecting. Oh, the sculpture. okay. So you're not on their side. You're okay. Right, got it. No. Okay. And in fact, what's what I love is if you look, if you follow the ground line, the distortion is very slight. Mm-hmm. So it makes the illusion, and I saw that, and I was like, "Oh, this is cool." Mm-hmm. Uh, and in fact, I was waiting for someone to appear. Mm-hmm. So I just sat there for a while right. until that woman, and then I couldn't decide if I should shoot her with her foot in the red or just completely out of the other. I decided, no, that'll be my bridge in. Nice. So difference. The theme was difference, and also the idea that society, a great writer once said, his history is a distorted mirror. Mm-hmm. And society is a bit of a distorted mirror. It uh-huh. has a a problem perceiving itself and difference, and you would know this, Rand, certainly the performances you did in 1994 in which you really, you were really surprising and different, right? So difference, the celebration of difference Mm -hmm. as an expression of diversity and identity, there it is, right? And so, and I I also really like it when, when, with your camera, um, if you can create illusions. Uh-huh. Sure. Um, I went through a, a big phase, and I didn't choose a work like this, but I went through a phase where I was very interested in trying to manipulate photographic image to make it look, basically paint with a camera. Got it. Yeah. And so trying, whether it was motion or saturation, all sorts of variation. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm interested in exploring, but... The London piece was both a way of, because if you look at that scene, the top left corner is the one area. That natural is clear. light. Yeah, natural. Yeah. So you, it, you can sort of see the way that the world is broken up into colors, mm. zones. Let me, let me chime in. Let me just chime in with my Please. idea. Okay. Cause, okay. So, um, just for somebody who's listening to this. Okay. So essentially, it's like you've got, okay. So you have the rectangle of the, of the shape of the image and, it's all kind of sectioned off into these rectangles. So at the top left, as Justin just said, there's this one little, little, little rectangle of natural light where you have a little bit of the sky that's kind of blown out and you've got the leaves of a tree. Okay, so that's almost like an anchor point of normal color. But below that is this red, long um, rectangle of just red. 
And then there's a, the, a foot just kind of stepping. And then you've got this weird kind of purpley color. And there's a woman walking, maybe with a person. And then the, the next long rectangle is almost too dark to perceive. And then the next one over is this weird kind of peach color. And then you see uh, the, the, the figure of the photographer, which is Justin, holding up the, the, the camera, iPhone, whatever, in front at eye level, uh, although he's crouched. And then the, you can see that the road goes into the next sort of series of, of like um, rectangles, vertical rectangles, where one person is like lying on his or her back with a knee up on the a leg up on its knee. And then you've got the trees and you've got grasses and then you've got people having a picnic. And this is the kind of most, the brightest yellow kind of scene. So nice. I love this image because it, it does what you were saying, but then like to, to kind of tie things back, um, one of the artists that I really gravitated to, really influenced me was Marcel Duchamp and his ready-mades. Mm. And then yep. in a way, the ready-made is kind of like the everyday poetry uh, that you kind of are, are, are noticing. And mm -hmm. I love the idea that you can walk through a city and I think architecture and and urban planning and all this stuff was something that you used to talk a lot about, which yep. I'm sure is still bubbling and boiling and simmering in your head. This notion of going through life, going through a city, going through a park where planners said, okay, let's have an art installation, whatever. In it, people are going to walk through in their own daily lives and they themselves are going to create creative moments or creative acts or whatever and here you are and i love that the fact that you are re the reflection but what we're doing is you're fo you're you're photographing a scene of people like you're an observer and in the image of, of being the observer you're you're part of it as a reflection yet it's really hard to know are you part of that scene or not I, you know the more you know as i look at it you're a smart son of a gun i love this <laughs> It is awesome, man. Beautiful shit. Yeah. Beautiful shit. Yeah, I, I love it. Well, and one thing, Ren, it's you're probably not aware, but the much, the research that I've been in, because a lot of my research was on big box stores. That's kind of I kind of went for that. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of it, it was anyway. I got sick of it. I've been working on graffiti and street art and vandalism for the last almost ten years. Oh. And that idea that there is a unique way of seeing the city, that every single, there's a unique subjectivity, which you see in graffiti, you can also see in interactions mm -hmm. with art. Yeah. Absolutely. So, I mean, the, what I call the aesthetic city, the city of visual experience. Ah, now that's something, you saying the aesthetic city takes me yeah. back decades. So clearly yeah. there is a, there is a, Threads, roots, branches, channels. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, still me. Now, well, of course, of course. Just like me, I'm still me, just with a bit more gray hair. Well, yeah, gray hair and, and reading glasses. Uh, anyway. Sure. Uh, All right. Let's move on to the next photo, shall we? Wonderful. Yes. Okay, la. Oh, Dive whoa. in, my friend. So this photograph is taken uh, during sunrise on the lightning field which is an art installation sculpture I visited in 2015. Mm -hmm. and this is in Camado, New Mexico. Oh, okay. Middle of nowhere. And can I just say, because it's such a rare opportunity to get to say this, I feel like I'm Bugs Bunny when I say it is three hours south of Albuquerque. Nice. So my what I wanted to mention is and why I sent you that photograph, I would say to everyone, if anyone's listening, um, follow <laughs> up on... <laughs> well, you know. Follow up... <laughs> I would just recommend to... Thank you. Okay. You recommend, yeah? Honestly, follow up on at least some of your dreams. Okay. Right? Yeah, for sure. And... Um, there's a very famous, um, in my world, contemporary art, art world, there's a book by uh, an Australian writer. 
His name is Robert Hughes. Mm -hmm. And the book has, has got a ridiculously overinflated title as well. It's called American Visions. Oh. It was all about American art. Okay. And the cover photograph of this book was of the lightning field. Okay. And so I, when I started teaching, when I left McGill, and then I realized that, yeah, there's no future in really old stuff, old art, old buildings. So mm -hmm. I, I, I very quickly became contemporary. Okay. And the lightning field I read about, and I thought it was the most biz like bonkers, brilliant idea. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I got to get there one day. Great pilgrimage. And so, yes. And, and so this is a, a real pilgrimage spot. So the year 2015, I decided I, at the time, I was, my girlfriend at the time was an astronomer. And she had a connection that was bizarre to Marfa, Marfa, Texas. Marfa is another key art pilgrimage spot, mm -hmm. site. Um, and so I thought, I'll just combine them. Nice. So, and you have to buy tickets. What? Months. Really? Yeah, yeah. To get on the lightning field, you, you, the tickets go on sale on March and, and they're sold out for the year by the end of the end of the month. Oh, wow. So you go online and it's, you buy your ticket and you get 24 hours on the lightning field with that ticket. Oh, wow. And so you have a very specific date and time. And so I remember flying to Albuquerque getting in the rental car, buying some cigarettes, and then driving for three hours to mm -hmm. the south and, like, seriously, roadrunner, red cliffs kind right. of country. And you arrive in this village of Kamado that did not have a lit... That had an intersection, but no lights. Oh, wow. There's nothing there, but there is an office for this incredibly avant-garde New York-based art organization called DIA. And you go and you meet the four other people and the six of you get put in an SUV and driven about 45 minutes, mostly vertical, mm -hmm. to the lightning field. And wow. there's a cabin oh, oh, oh. and the six of you have got 24 hours and you're provided with food and whatever. There's no Internet and and you get dropped off there. So now the lightning field itself, of course, everyone prays for lightning. Mm -hmm. Because it, what it is, is it's a grid that is one kilometer by one mile made of 45 foot tall steel spikes. Okay, so it's one kilometer by one mile. Just by to be one clear. mile. Okay, interesting that, that, that they would do it that way. Okay. Well, steel yeah. spikes? Yeah, the artist is, is a very, he loves measurement. Okay. Steel spikes that are 45 feet tall. And they're set out at a grid. What's really amazing is, even though the ground, it's a very big space, mm -hmm. is obviously not even. If you were to, the tips of every spike is at exactly the same height. Okay, right. Interesting. Which, I got talking to one of the guys, the, the guy's ma the maintenance man, and he said that's the hardest thing. Right, for sure. Because during a lightning storm, they're designed to attract lightning. And so you can, the, the, the dream is to be sitting, there's a little cabin, it's an old homesteader's cabin. And when you sit there, you're on the edge of the lightning field and lightning could hit these steel spikes and you could just be sitting there and that's, that's the art. Wow. Right? And then they have to replace the spikes because they get literally incinerated. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, that's what it's about. Can now, I, 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 go ahead. Uh, what I, okay, we're going to come back to what it's about for a second. Just uh, I, I, I want to describe. Okay, so what it is is uh, roughly half of the image is sky and half of the image is ground. The sky is there's a bit of cloud. Uh, it's kind of it's this weird. It's this very light cyan or kind of light blue. Right in the middle, there seems to be a, a mesa or, or far off in the distance. There's like this this kind of like hill by itself cutting the the horizon you can see very low hills the bottom half of the photo is looks like a grassy field with looks like black-eyed susans so it's like yellow flowers with with sort of dark insides the the grass is kind of greenish kind of brown um but as you say what, what's interesting is you have this grid Roughly in the middle to the right, there's the tallest uh, metal. I guess that now that we know it's a metal spike. How how thick are these 
tower things, spike things. Probably like an inch or so. Oh, okay, about an inch there. Okay, uh, they're yeah. catching the light. So nice photograph because it catches the light. It's they're kind of golden, yeah. and there's one. And then what? How? What's the dis- distance between one and the one to the to its left? Roughly. <laughs> I knew you were going to ask that. I think it's probably ten meters. Oh, between. okay. Okay. It's okay. a really, it's really big. So about thirty and, feet. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I shot that at dawn. Yeah. And um, what I was going for, and I'm not sure if I achieved it. I don't think I did, but I like the color on that. Is that there is a moment when just the tips of the spikes mm-hmm. light up. They oh, all okay. catch the sunlight. Oh, okay, okay. And it's. It, it, I swear, I'm, you're standing there, and it's like candles. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Oh, so nice. I, but it wouldn't photograph. Or I, I, I shot a lot. Yeah. But we couldn't really capture that. Mm. Um, I want look. I have to say, just it's an interesting photograph. Like it's just mm-hmm. you know um, looking at it now. Okay, so let's rewind our discussion back to the about. So sure. So what it's about? It's brilliant. The, old, the artist, Walter de Maria, who I've studied and seen lots of his stuff, he's a brilliant man. The attraction of seeing a lightning burst mm-hmm. explode, just like on the cover of Robert Hughes' American Vision. Oh, wow. Drags 85% of the pilgrims. Because mm-hmm. we've all studied it. We've all, we all want to see it. But you get there, and I got there in the middle of storm season, and it was a perfectly beautiful night. Mm-hmm. So, of course, what that means is a couple things. First of all, there's nothing else to do. Mm-hmm. Walk and walk. And you end up walking this, and you're, you're quite high elevation. Okay. It's a high mountain plain, so it's cool. But you walk and walk and walk, and then eat dinner. And I remember sitting out, and remember, I was dating an astronomer, so this was nice, getting a blanket, sitting outside. Imagine what the stars look oh, like. Oh, nice. A in the middle of New Mexico. So incredible aesthetic experience. And, but of course there was no lightning. But the next morning when I watched the tips of all the spikes light up and dawn was arriving, what it really struck me, it felt like I was actually in a painting. Okay. I felt like I was in a landscape painting, like those big paintings you see in galleries. It 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 kind of felt like I'd walked right into it. And including that mesa, and it is a mesa, in the distance, everything about it, it helps you realize the sort of how the whole world is a work of art. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Right? Tout le monde, right? Like, it really is. Truly, in that way, it, it, uh, it wakes up your senses to the aesthetic of that's all around you. Wow, wow. And it really was like walking through a painting. It was amazing. Imagine this, your photograph blown up to the size of like a monumental light box of, say, I don't know, like two meters by three meters or whatever it is. Full Jeff Wall. We'll just say full Jeff Wall. Massive, massive. And you're standing away from, say, 10 feet or 20 feet. Mm -hmm. I can absolutely understand why standing there, uh, you could feel like you're essentially within a painting, within a, you know, that, that you're living through a sort of, artful moment okay now here's a here's here's a here's a big question for you okay so what who cares well i mean that is true of so much about art and my attitude is if somebody is going to say like oh i fucking hate art art's bullshit art's pretentious it's like i am i'm 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 over it Mm -hmm. i'm it's like I'm not here to, to argue with people who are, in my opinion, idiots, right? But if they want to have an argument about it, I suppose, but I'm not even that interested anymore. Mm. And if people want to say like, oh, you know, what a wanker, it's like, well, you could say the same thing about the, the owner of a professional football team. Mm. Well, that's an interesting point. Like in a way, for example, I, I love your example. I love your example. Professional football team yeah. so good. Let's put it this way. The audience of a football team, the people in the, in the crowd move to such emotion, right? With the alcohol and yeah. with the screaming and with the highs are essentially watching a very complex performance 
where the yeah. actors the actors all have to play within very very tight rules and even when they break the rules it's part of the performance and yeah like a, a, like say turn it around and say and i'm sure you've done this with your students turn it around and say okay well deconstruct or deco- decode the spectacle of watching a football game as if it were a, a, a massive theatrical performance or an opera yeah you know and as somebody who like i've really grown to love opera okay which is so talk about being a wanker right uh, or being pretentious right no no but the truth is like i've loved this orchestra my whole life mm-hmm. but that didn't come from any from from my parents uh-huh. my parents hate classical music they okay. just listen to jazz so i took it on my own and I've come to really appreciate opera. I think it's kind of, it's amazing. And truly, American football, like American football, mm-hmm. is like a full three-act opera. For sure. I could totally, like, yeah, just just move the, the perception over just one one channel over, one track over, and yep. say, okay, imagine imagine if a big football game is actually an opera. Yeah, I, you, who couldn't see that? Who couldn't make that connection? Like in terms of the costumes, in terms of the rituals, yeah. The skills. Yeah. And like football is controlled improvisation. Mm-hmm. There's rules, there's practice, sure. but then full improv. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. So, you know. Okay, so <clears throat> let's, let's, let's rewind to, your perf- to a performance, right? Like, okay. My drive when, when we were doing performance was I didn't yeah. want... I want each one to be very different from the previous one, right? So, and, and not being too caught up on it looking pretty or sounding pretty or, and not necessarily being, you know, contemptuous of the, uh, of the audience, but wanting to give each audience kind of like a new hit each time. Now, and, and because of that, I kind of felt that my, my most recent work was me attempting to get closer to some kind of, authentic expression but always feeling that my next work would be the closer to my ne- my next great work was the one after the one i just did so yeah in your case think of your previous performance and what is the next one that's going to take that expression to the next level well you know what it is ran i would say that one thing first of all no offense, but I think anyone who goes through a creative writing program has that, that's a shared characteristic. Okay. Where every, the only thing that's worth reading is what I just wrote. Everything else, whatever, right? I don't care. In my world, which is, you know, in art and academia, it's like, no, 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 no. We hold on to stuff because maybe in a few years we can use it. So I think that thing... One of the differences, the poetry that you were very engaged in, and same with Victoria, was considerably more avant-garde than, say, what Scott, Vince, and I were doing, Mm -hmm. which, which, based on the audience responses we used to get, was very successful, Mm -hmm. because people liked it. They could, you know, Mm -hmm. what, what they were most comfortable with. But I certainly have found, in the last 10 years of poetry, my expectations of poetry have been decreasing and decreasing and decreasing. And these are expectations which were, uh, these are the dreams of youth, mm-hmm. right? Got it. We're allowed to be young and ambitious, whatever and we whatever, try. Yeah. Ambitious and da, 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 right? But now you can either give it up or if you are still reflecting, still observing, still writing, you're still practicing. Practice makes poetry. I find um, I am much more uh, emotionally sophisticated and prepared for performance. Right. Got it. If I didn't sweat a little bit, I, would, I wouldn't be alive. Mm-hmm. Right? So I'm still going to be, you're still going to feel a little bit, right? But nerves, really, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not afraid of failure, which is very common when you're young, because you're still young. You're still, even though we're, right. we, let's face it, we all kind of run on youthful uh, ignorance, but I th- at this point now it's just a question of uh, enjoying mm. the actual oratory. Right, got it, got it. Way of saying it. Saying things differently is hard because I try to do that, but then it just depends on. It's an energy piece, right? 
Okay, yeah. One of the things that's happening in this sort of great pause where it, for example, in your case, you are separated by the Pacific Ocean between uh, Victoria yes. and Beijing from your spouse. Uh, when were yep. you uh, when were you married? We got married July 23rd of this year. This year. Oh my goodness. And then and then right out of lockdown, man. And and then she went to Beijing and you were in Victoria and then you've been yep. you haven't seen each other since or you have. So very quickly, um, I was in Beijing in May of last year, July of last year, and November of last year. So I was, I was in Beijing three times. Okay, okay. Both doing uh, giving papers uh, and also visiting with Pei. And then she came in January. We were going to spend Christmas, but it was hard to arrange. She arrived just after New Year's. She was supposed to be in Victoria for two months. Mm-hmm. And then, then 2020 happened. Right, right, right. And China, as we, as we know, and you know, because yeah. you're in Hong Kong, shut down and her return flight was canceled. Oh, man. So she was, and we were like, I've got a lot of built up credit with Air Canada mm-hmm. on canceled flights now. Oh, wow. But she got home after seven months. And during that time, we were together 24 mm-hmm. 7. Well, of course. Well, of course. So how beautiful that at the end of it, the day before she went home, we got married. Wow! Uh, oh. Just to, to put, <laughs> I, I I want to also uh, because I, I we talked we had briefly glanced uh, the, or touched on this. Put it in perspective, you know, you two met in New York City, yep. in a in a gallery or in a, in a museum. Yep. So which museum was it? In the Brooklyn Museum of Art. Brooklyn Museum of Art. Sweet and and. Uh, you have a long-standing history. How many times have you been to Brooklyn, to the Brooklyn Museum of Art, personally or professionally? Which, at least six times. Okay, six. Yeah, six okay. times. Okay, okay. That was the sixth visit. So you both met, uh, I mean, how poetically beautiful. You both met, really, in an art, in a, in a, in a museum. And yeah. that's how you first connected. Wow, that's a, what a beautiful, beautiful story. That's great. Well, it's, it's nice because... Um, I was married, then I've been divorced for about 10 years. Um, and so, I, I, you know, I've been enthusiastic about dating. And often dates would involve going to the art gallery. Mm-hmm. And w- in which you discover, as often in the case, is that, yeah, she's not that into art. Right. So how nice to just call the... Call, that's, we, that's not even up for debate. No. I, didn't, I didn't bring her to the art gallery. Sure. I met her there. So in, in yes. front of which artist? Oh, uh, oh, the Korean painter. Uh, was it Kwon Jung? I think it's Kwon Jung. I put you on the spot. No stress. So okay, the, now let's let's make some connections. Uh, look, I've had you uh, on for almost an hour, and for me, it's candy. Okay. But let's make some connections back to when you had <laughs> that first camera, and you made that you know, the photograph with the zoom of the close up yeah. of um, Columbus. Columbus. What connections can you make between then and now in terms of your own maturity, in terms of how you've developed and somebody who's who's listening who might be like, well, what kind of like how do aesthetics tie in across your life? Mm. Well, it's interesting. First of all, that photograph, one of the reasons why it's so memorable to me is because I've been taking photos of statues, similarly, isolate, sky, whatever, since. Okay. That's been a regular part of my photographic practice, photographing art, which partly because I either use the images for my own for teaching or I just want to make the images. And so it connects to something we were just talking about, about the aesthetics of everyday life, of the city, of finding these moments. That's why I love studying vandalism and graffiti, because it's always it's always just over here. It's mm-hmm. over here. Oh. So, you know, that image of Columbus, and I, I, I also chose it because truly it was symbolically pregnant. Mm-hmm. You know, image of Columbus in Nassau, this is 1984, so we're, we're getting really close to what really was a big, big historical revision of mm-hmm. the way that Columbus was thought of. Right, right. So 
And that kind of thinking has stuck with me my whole time. In fact, I've been working for the last few years. Uh, I've been writing on a city that tore down sculptures but left the left the podiums. Oh, okay. Huh. And I love that image. Just mm-hmm. these, you go to a park and there's a bunch of podiums. And mm-hmm. you can see they've been vandalized a long time ago. And they're just sitting there. So I, it's, it's like monuments about monuments. Oh, wow, wow, wow. So, okay, so to, to, to wrap it up, somebody who wants to become your student, they, uh, can't, they can't be your student. Now you're not teaching, right, at, in Victoria at the moment. Well, not this year. Okay. Not this year. Uh, if someone wanted to come and study with me, first of all, just find me at Vancouver Island University because that's kind of home base for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've been there for 16 years. But I'm also teaching at the University of Victoria. I was invited to teach at the Central Academy of Fine Arts in Beijing, but that's okay. Uh, it'll they've, already, they've asked me to do that. I've already I did that in 2019. I'm sure it'll come back. And but mainly, just if anybody is interested in any of this, go to viu.ca, find me, and send me an email, and I'd be delighted to talk. You're the man. I love talking about art. Justin McGrail! Thank you so much, man. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much for joining me, Randall Fancy, for this episode of Shutting It Raw. I really appreciate it. If you want to learn more about the show and Joe or today's guest in particular, be sure to check out the episode notes at www.shootingraw.com. Raw. I appreciate everyone who takes some time out of their day to give shooting it raw a listen. So get out there, make amazing photos, and be sure to appreciate how amazing the world is. Gratitude and a sense of humor 